So what we'll do is just set up a very straightforward situation, two people having a conversation across a table. And let's imagine for the sake of argument, it's a three camera shoot. We've got to do a wide and close ups at the same time. So what I would usually do is I'd start off with doing the wide shot, get one camera on the wide and then the over the shoulders could be mid shot. So you're not right into the face. So you can get away with the shadows being, the eyes being a little bit shadowy as they would have to be from the wide shot. But then when we go in for the closer cross shoot, you'll see what we do. Bring this frame down to spread the, spread the light as much as possible into, whoa, okay. No, no, try that, sit down now, Justin, because you're a fairly tall fellow and we don't want to, I don't want to injure you at all, especially if you have to... I'd say that's a bit too low. I'm a bit worried that if you suddenly get up, if you're a, if you're a very expensive actress who suddenly decides they want to get up, whoa, and they crack their head open on the corner of the frame, I'll be in trouble. <laughs> okay. That's pretty good, isn't it? So you can see now that the... I'll, I'll take this away for now. But you can see without any additional lighting, just bringing this in, it's spread, it's made the source bigger. It's kind of almost doubled the size of the source. So it's, it's now uh, Justin's getting light in his eyes from here, as opposed to all the way up here. And that's without any fill. So now we're kind of getting, getting, to, a good, getting to a good place with the basic key light on the face. But there's not, still not enough light in the eyes. So if I just bring a little, uh, little reflector in here, silver, a bit hard maybe, probably stay with the white for now, it's just a little bit gentler. But the eyes are still just a bit dead, so that's with nothing, that's with silver, feels a little bit lit to me that, just picking up too much, Trying. I don't want to see that. What I try and avoid is, you see the shadow there on the, on, uh, on the throat. If I bring it, if the, if the bounce is too much from below, you start to see a shadow from the collar on the, chin, on, the, uh, on the neck, which is something I try to avoid. It gives it away. So if I go white, so what I might do in these situations, I start with this. I might just break it up with something. It just breaks it up a little bit, so you get a little tiny bit in the eyes, but not too much. Okay, and then we we'll use the other lamp that um, Dado do, the projector lens. This is the DLED 7. Once upon a time, I would have used the 400 Dado or the 650, 400 Daylight or the 650 Tungsten, but now with the, the new uh, LEDs, it saves a lot of power, a lot of weight, and a lot of um, uh, complication but we've still got the same projector attachment and this is a really interesting way to get just a little bit of fill light in the eyes without uh, putting too much light on the, uh, so we're using on the, the face. The DP2 with the built-in barn doors. Yeah. So. Obviously it's going to be very crude for now but we'll, we'll refine we'll that. Out and and I might just take the, can I just take the lamp a little bit higher? Yeah, of course you so can. So it's... Uh, you may want to come. You know, this, to be honest, I'd probably use a silver, a stronger stand for this. Oh, okay. Well, I think uh, in we'll... In reality, but... Three different types of diffusion you can throw on this. Okay. Just looking to put a little bit of an eye light. So right now, this is obviously, it looks, uh, it looks very unpleasant. It's just a letterbox of light on his eyes, which is not going to work at all. So, so the Dado projectors come with a DPI set, which is a, a dimpled diffuser. So this is the lightest one. Still too light, because we don't, what we don't want, obviously we don't want to see the light moving, which it won't on the day. We don't want to see the edge of the, um, edge of the beam there. It needs to look unlit. So you stick the next one in. That's getting there now. You can just see a little bit of light in the eyes. Block it out. You can... And then what if we tried the heavier one? Yeah. 
So to my eye, that looks exactly right. You get a little pin of light in the eyes. You don't see any effect of the lighting on the rest of the face at all. There's no nose shadow. There's no sense of any perimeter to the light. But you're just, you're just getting the light. I think it's actually all right. I think it's all right with the three, with the three okay. levels of diffusion in. Just out of interest, we can change the color on this too, can't we? Yeah. So, so that's made it more daylight, mm -hmm. more tungsten. I might actually just put a tiny bit of daylight into it because it takes away the red in the eyes. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, that looks that looks very good. Even though you can get away with using less light and the a less less quantity of light in order to get a good exposure on the digital chips, the quality of the light changes adversely because when you use a bigger light source, even though it's pumping out a lot more light, you get a nicer quality of light because it's a bigger a bigger head. So you'll always, if you're, if you're lighting a set, you'll get a, a more attractive light with a 2K than you will with a 650. So it's been a way for the purity of the light, even though you only need the output of a 650, you'd be better off using a 2K with 0.6 ND on it. Get the same amount of light because the bigger Fresnel, if you're using hard light, bigger Fresnel gives you a more even spread of light and it's, a, it's a, a more attractive quality of light. Which is why I think subconsciously, subtly, when you look at films that were shot you know, in the film days and earlier, 10, 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, the quality of the lighting is much cleaner and I think in many respects much better because cinematographers had to use, had to really know how to use big lights. And when you can control a big light well, you'll always get a better light than with a small lamp. And now cinematographers find all they need to use are small lights to get a really good exposure, a good looking image on the Alexa and the RED. But the quality of the light isn't as good. In fact, I found that, I found that last year I was doing a workshop teaching at the National Film School and it was a close-up beauty lighting workshop and the students were shooting on film and all they had was 200 ASA film and I found myself with the students you know we were lighting this I was sort of showing them how I would light the scene but I was back to using 5Ks and 10Ks to get a nice clean key light as opposed to 650s and 300s and when I looked back at the rushes I was it reminded me of how good that style of lighting was that I hadn't forgotten about, but it had been dormant for many, many years. So I never would dream of pulling out a 10K on an Alexa. It would just be complete overkill. If you look at the quality of work on the screens today, and it's fantastic, but I worry that there's a generation of cinematographers coming up now who will have had less and less experience with really big lamps and slow, slow film, lots of lighting, and being able to hone the exposure and the lighting using large units. That's the principle of soft lighting, is the bigger the source, the softer the light. And the bigger the source, it, all, it has to do with the proximity of the light source to the person that you're lighting. I mean, you can use a five foot octodome, but if you put it 20 feet away, it's gonna be a hard light because it's a small source relative to the artist. But you bring it in, the closer you bring it in, the softer it gets, and the more it wraps around, and the more it creates its own fill light, and the less fill you need, because it's, the wrap around is giving you the key and the fill at the same time, which is the great beauty of soft light when it's used well. The objective is always, if you want to light softly, is to get the biggest source you can. And that means if you, can't, if, you, if you can't get the source in close to someone, well then you've got to use a, a 20 by 20 or a 40 by 40 foot source. That's how you're gonna get the soft light. 
but if you can get in, get to within sort of eight or nine feet, then that's the tool to use. And the, obviously, conversely, you know, the same applies to hard light. And I love using hard light. I light with hard light all the time. And the opposite applies. The hard, you know, the, if you want a hard light, the harder the light, the smaller the source, and the further away it needs to go. So that's always the, the mantra with hard lighting, is get that lamp as far, as far away from the artist as you can to get those crisp shadows. So you're always you're kind of balancing the two things all the time. And that's a mistake I see students do, is they take, they get a, a reefer light or a soft light or an octodome or whatever, and they stick it on the other side of the room, and they, want, they can't work out why the light's not that, creating that beautiful soft light that they think it's supposed to deliver. <laughs> so this is another typical example of the pan or the octodome. Small room, little 30s, semi, two up, two down, and one, two, three, four, there'll, be, there'll end up being six people around a table. Sunday lunch is very, very busy with props because of food, two cameras, so that again, you don't have to do too many takes, you don't want to have the repeats on the food. So you want to get through it as quickly as you can. So the lighting needs to be simple, beautiful, because we've got various actresses of different ages. You've got 20-year-old, 40-year-old, 50-year-old, and they all need to look good, and some are, you know, need a little bit more um, help than others. Some don't need anything. But you, if there is a, a one-size-fits-all lamp, bingo, the Octodome has done it. And uh, the scene looked great. It was a really successful scene. We shot it incredibly fast. All the actresses had that beautiful, soft glow to them. And again, we could use two cameras all around the table. And there was never a situation where one angle looked less good on the a one actress than the other uh, than, than the other camera angle. They all looked good all the time. And it's very simple, um, a very simple setup. Interestingly, this was a from a rigging point of view. We needed to shoot th completely 360 in this room, so there's no way for a, nowhere for a lamp. We couldn't we couldn't boom the lamp, um, so it actually had to be rigged into the ceiling. But if we'd rigged any scaffolding, that would have uh, dropped the lamp down too low. Uh, and also there was cornicing in the ceiling, so you, couldn't, you would have had to screw in below the cornicing, which would have, which would have uh, made the exercise null and void, because I wouldn't have been able to get a decent wide shot without the lamp being in frame. So what the uh, gaffer and the rigger did, which was very clever and worked very well with the octodome, was they removed the ceiling rows in the middle of the room where the existing household light was. And they fixed a little batten in the ceiling piece uh, where the rose was. And just, because the octodome is so light, they could just screw it straight into the batten and run the cable. Uh, I think they ran the cable over the joists and down through a little mouse hole in another room. You couldn't have created that big soft source with any other lamp because of the, this was a purely a physical thing, because of the physical weight of the octodome, because it's so light. No other lamp could have been, no other lamp which could produce that level of soft light could have been rigged in that way, because it would have been too heavy. So that was a great advantage, a great bonus. But the seven foot, it's a much bigger lamp, and I have used it very successfully, but it has more limited applications because of the size and because of the depth of it. So it worked very well, for example, in this location. There's a wedding party in an upstairs room with a vaulted ceiling. I couldn't, there was, again, 40 extras plus the principals. You couldn't put anything on the floor, so everything was up above. And the seven-foot octodome up here gave a very nice, um, nice big fill for the room. And it was the day, I had to use the daylight one because it was very bright outside. Five-foot wouldn't have done it. If five foot wouldn't have been uh, punchy enough. Um, but the seven foot, conversely, would not have worked in any of those other locations that I showed you, the pub location, the uh, small room. It would have, it, the added depth uh, makes it much harder to use in a, in a tighter space. So I'll say the seven foot, it's a great lamp, but it's got to be a big enough space to use it comfortably. This is exactly the same setup. We've not 
move the position of the key light at all. We're doing close-ups now, still three cameras. The wide shot is a tight two, 50-52 uh, shot, and each uh, close-up camera is a, is a medium close-up over the shoulder. But now we've got a little bit, the only difference is we've introduced this trace frame here just to soften and spread the light a little bit more into the eye so we don't get the panda eyes. And uh, introduced two little uh, eye lights cross, cross keying from either side. This, this one for Josh, just that's off and that's on. You should just be able to see the little glint in the eye, not lighting the rest of the face. And uh, this one for Justin, just that little chink of light in the eyes, nothing else. Because everything is in the eyes. You don't want to, you don't want to put too much light on other parts of the face, just the eyes. So Josh and Justin, carry on your conversation now. Over to you. Tell me more about this hotel. <laughs> I'm just crossing. So we're going for the whole week. The same as bringing a light down lower, but without having to bring the lamp down lower. And it just, you, it's, it's, it's moving the source from up there to down here and that is that explains what I said earlier about a bigger source closer softens the light and that's exactly what we've done just by introducing a trace frame we're not putting any more lighting it's just created a larger source closer to the artist so it's a softer more appealing light and we haven't lost any exposure at all with that frame I'd say maybe the third of a stop that was taken off the overall exposure can easily be compensated for on the iris in the camera and maybe it's just some slight um, adjustments to the level of light in the background but it's minimal. So this is the DP2 projector that we were using in more detail it's got the built-in framing shutters here very easy they don't fall out you can't go wrong with them absolutely bulletproof because the light the light output from the projector is obviously net by default very hard coming through the blades. If you just want to soften it off, you get the DPI set that uh, come in three different strengths that just drop in in front of the lens. The one, two, and three. Obviously, you can use them individually, or you can combine the DPI filters together or use them on their own to create the precise amount of softness that you want. So you do one, there's room for two, and if you want a third one to really soften it off, there's room for three. From the lighting, setup that we did, I found it worked best with all three actually, because it, it gave you just the, just the light in the eyes that you wanted without any, uh, any edge effect from the, uh, from the projector blades. Perfect. I gotta say, I thought this was, the lighting was really beautiful in this scene. It worked particularly nicely because of the, the way you have these wood paneling on the walls around the, the room and you get that lovely soft top light which focuses the light onto the table and you get the glow on the tabletop and the fall off on the walls and you get those rich honey colored background tabletop tones balancing in with the very pleasing flesh tone. Just shows you again with one light source and very minimal extra fill for the close-ups what you can do with the octodome, at least what, how I can make it work to my advantage. So, so the scene starts here, develop off the newspaper, all of this, no relighting between any of these shots here. It'd be nice if I, there, okay, so there's the wide shot. So you can see this is the big soft top light on the wide, lovely little reflection off the chair in the foreground here, um, beautiful fall off on, in the background no light hitting the walls, um, it's just perfect really. Um, and the best thing about it was that in this lighting I didn't need to do anything at all going into any of this coverage, in fact that was with the second camera shot at the same time as the wide, except just put a little bit of an eye light in the eyes there. A little bit, so I mean I would use a little, um, I'd either use a, just a bit of silk, probably just a little bit of silver. Certainly for the more elderly actress, for her close-up, I would have kept the, um, you know, octodome, that stays where it is, but I would have probably just flown in a little uh, diffusion frame underneath, just to s spread the light a little bit more, and then a bit of silver 
a little silver reflector or something on the table to put a little bit of a pin prick in the eyes. And, um, and that's it. That's the beauty of it. Uh, it just makes it fun to shoot because you know you can do it really quickly and everyone looks good. So just to sum up what we've done here, I've been using the projector with built-in framing shutters as opposed to the gobo with loose leaf shutters. Now the built-in framing shutters on the new DP2 projector makes shaping the light really quick, simple, intuitive and easy. Whereas in the past there was often a lot of fiddling around with blades and leaves to try and get the light to do exactly as one wanted it to do. But now straight out of the box in the hand and I've done it in 10 or 15 seconds. And I love to light this way. I love that mixture of soft light and a real hard little chink of light in the eyes. I think it's a great look. And these, these lamps allow me to do exactly what I've always loved doing lighting wise, but now in a, in a very uh, speedy and efficient manner. And I would say generally, this is a, a simple example that when you see this film cut together of how to shoot a conversation scene around any conversation scene around a table, armchairs, it could, you know, we could multiply this tenfold. So you have 20 people and a Downton Abbey dinner. And you know, instead of using one octodome, I might use three down the length of the table. But the principle applies. You just be able to set it up, go around, shoot all the wides and mids, maybe introduce a little bit of diffusion for the close-ups, something in the eyes very quickly, and still continue to use multiple cameras and get a, a great look. So thank you very much.